Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. One of the most hotly debated doctrines is that of God's sovereignty over our salvation. And today as we study Romans chapter 9, we will see that this is the clear teaching of Scripture. So welcome to the Key Chapters Podcast. I'm Russ Brewer, pastor of Wellington Community Church in Wellington, Colorado. Thanks for listening to today's podcast as we go through Romans chapter 9. We've got a challenging chapter ahead of us. Now, before we open up Romans 9, we need to keep in mind the context that has brought us here. Throughout the past eight chapters, Paul has been setting forth a heavy message for his Jewish readers. Paul's been explaining to them that their religion, or at least the empty carnal form of it, is incapable of making them righteous before God. And so if they want true righteousness, it must be on the basis of faith. Specifically, as we're seeing now as we go through Romans, faith in Jesus as the only sacrifice for our sins. Now, in all of this, Paul has just been laying down the groundwork that God fulfilled all of those messianic prophecies in the person of Jesus Christ, his son. And so with the coming of the Messiah, there is now establishment of a new kingdom. And so there is now a new people of God on this earth. And these people are the first fruits of the kingdom of God, which is still to come. Now, for Paul's Jewish readers, this is going to set off all kinds of alarms for them because all along they've been the chosen people of God. And and now if there's this new people of God, then what's God's plan for the Jewish folks? Well, Paul is going to answer that question over the next three chapters, and our study today in Romans chapter 9 is going to lay down the theological foundation that no matter what, God is sovereign over all of these details. So with that as the background, let's get now to Romans chapter 9. The opening verses of Romans 9 shows us Paul's heart for his people. He loves his people, and he is grieved that so many of his own people are rejecting their Jewish Messiah. And here here they've been waiting for the Messiah for all these centuries. And now that he has finally arrived, they're so opposed to him that Paul has to recognize they're spiritually blinded and that God is sovereign over all these things. He's sovereign even over the blindness that he's seeing among his own people. Now, these are hard truths for us to hear. And these are even hard truths for Paul to say. And so the opening verses show us his hurting but trusting heart for his people. And so Paul says in verses 1 to 3, he says, I am telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies within me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were a curse, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Just an incredible statement of love here as he's just heartbroken that so many of his own people are rejecting Jesus. And so Paul is burdened for them because he knows of the blessings that are theirs if they would come to Jesus in faith. And so he lists them off in verses 4 and 5. Look at these blessings. They they have the adoption of sons of God. They have the glory of the covenants and the law. Uh, They have the joy of the temple services and all the promises of forgiveness that those offered. Uh, Their own fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, had led them to God and established the people of the covenant who were then stewards of the generations that brought forth the Messiah. These are wonderful blessings for being Jewish. And yet so many of Paul's own people are rejecting Jesus as their Messiah. And so in verse 6, Paul's quick to tell us it's not as though somehow God's word has failed, but rather the reality is that all along, not everyone who is biologically a member of the Jewish people is truly a spiritual benefactor of the blessings that God has been giving to them all along. And so Paul even reminds them in verses 7 and 8 that even Abraham had two sons, but only one actually received the promises of God. And in verses 9 to 13, Jacob had two sons as well, but only one of them was the chosen son through whom his descendants would receive the promises of God. In fact, in verse 13, we have this really uncomfortable verse because Paul quotes the book of Malachi saying, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. And Now, that's just a tough verse, and it seems to fly in the face of what we think of as a loving God and and how we know him to be. Now, the verse that Paul is quoting here is from Malachi 1.3, and Malachi 1.3 uses the word sane for hate. Now, I can't really soften the word, but the idea is to treat someone as an enemy. And in the passage in Malachi 1, the Lord is outlining how his judgments had fallen upon the descendants of Esau, and Paul is making the same point here in Romans 9.13, that not every descendant receives the promises and some will actually receive God's judgment. That's how it's been all along. And so although it may be difficult to fully understand all that goes into why God chooses some and not others, Paul is showing us that this is how it's been all along. 
In fact, Paul goes on to say in verse 14, what shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. In other words, no matter what we are tempted to say, God is perfectly just in all these decisions. He is sovereignly allowed to decide who he will bless and who he will judge. Paul then continues this line of thinking in verse 15 when he says, For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. You see, God is the one who decides whom he will pour his compassion upon. It's not our choice. And in verse 16, Paul says, So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. And the point that Paul is making is since saving faith must come from God, and since it's an act of his sovereign mercy, we're going to have to let God be God and trust him to open the hearts of the people whom he chooses, even if that means not including someone we might love, like how Paul loves his Jewish brethren here. Now, Paul makes this point powerfully with the example of Pharaoh. Pharaoh, of course, was the ruler of Egypt when God was delivering his people from slavery. Moses had gone before Pharaoh many times, calling upon Pharaoh to release the people. And many times, it says in the book of Exodus, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And it says many times, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, how did God do that? Well, we've got to be careful because the, the text doesn't exactly say, other than that God's power was shown to Pharaoh and, and Pharaoh saw it. He had a front row seat to the power of God. And as he saw who God was, Pharaoh didn't like God very much and he hardened his heart against him. And, and so it just seems that Pharaoh, in seeing the nature of who God was, just seeing that made his heart hard against the Lord. And Jesus says something even similar in John 8, 45, talking to the Jewish people. He says, because I speak the truth, you do not believe. And so there may be other aspects for how God hardens a person's heart. But here we're seeing that just seeing God's truth and and who he is will will often just have a hardening heart in the unbeliever's heart because they don't want this. They don't like this God when they find out who he is and what he's like. And so Paul basically sums up in verses 17 and 18 where, where God is a sovereign plan that basically anything other than a hardened heart when we see God, that's the mercy of God. And so this leads us to the natural question then that Paul knows his hearers are going to be asking. So he he asked the question for them in verse 19 saying, well, if we're all just obeying God anyway, then why is anyone under his judgment? Paul's answer in verse 20 is basically, first guys, mind your manners when you approach God. He is sovereign. Let us approach him with fear and reverence. And Paul doesn't say this, but that's the point. Let us approach him with fear and reverence when we're asking these kinds of questions. Let's just not just kind of go to God and shake our fist at him. Lamentations 3.39 makes a similar point when it says, Why should any living mortal or any man offer complaint in view of his sins? Because of our sins, we can't complain. We have to just trust God and just appeal to his mercy. Well, Paul then goes on to explain these things further in verses 21 and 22. Paul explains that God is like a potter and he's making all kinds of stuff with clay and he sovereignly chooses to make some clay into beautiful stuff and and other clay into other things and and basically he's saying, guys, the same lump of clay, you can use that same lump of clay to make something like a beautiful dinner plate and like a toilet bowl and it's up to God to choose what he's going to make out of the clay he has. And in all of this, Paul wants us to understand that God will be glorified. And so Paul says in verse 22, What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. And Paul's point here is that even if some lumps of clay are destined for wrath and other lumps of clay are destined for mercy, God will be glorified in how he handles this whole situation. God will be glorified. We need to understand that the glory that Paul is talking about here is where God's judgment will be established and it will be considered as righteous even by those who are facing and experiencing his judgment. He will still be glorified. No one when we stand before God will ever say, God, you're unjust. He will always be glorified. Now, we talked about this point at length in our podcast on Isaiah 45. And if you have any further questions about just the righteousness of God's judgment, then I'd encourage you to go listen to that podcast on Isaiah 45, because in my opinion, Isaiah 45 is one of those key chapters that unlocks the sovereign judgment of God over mankind and why he allows this world just to just do what it does and why it just seems like it's spinning out of control. And so the podcast for Isaiah 45 is roughly mid-June, around June 14th or so. And again, the point of that podcast, just to summarize it, is that when mankind faces God's judgment and sees the freedom that God's been giving to us and how sinfully we've used that freedom, 
all people will agree that God alone is righteous and just in his judgments. And so as we go back here to Romans chapter 9, Paul then begins to make things personal in verse 24 because he's not going to shy away from the implications of everything he's saying. He knows this is heavy stuff, but he's still driving the point forward. He recognizes that God has chosen to call people both from the Jews and the Gentiles. And yes, this is heavy implications, but do not be surprised, folks. And he goes on to quote Isaiah and Hosea and how this has been the plan of God all along. And so in verses 25 and 26, Paul cites Hosea chapter 1 and Hosea chapter 2, saying, as he says also in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, my people, as in they weren't my people, but I'll call my people. And her who is not beloved, beloved, as in like her who is estranged, I will call her beloved, my, one of my special loved ones that I love. It shall be in that place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. And so the point is, is that God has been planning all along to bring the Gentiles into the fold of God's people. Now, again, this should not be a surprise to us. We know from Genesis chapter 22, verse 18, that when the Lord told Abraham that, that in his seed all the world be blessed, we know from Galatians 3.16 that that word seed there is talking about Jesus. And so God's plan all along was for the nations. In Isaiah 66, the book of Jonah, so many places we see this point being made. And Paul is just making it clearly here. Now, Paul also wants them to know that God has worked this way with Israel in the past, as in in choosing some from among Israel. And so in verse 27, he's reminding them back in Isaiah chapter 10, verse 22, that even after the Babylonian exile, only a remnant actually returned. And so Paul goes on to say then in verse 29, if God does not save them, if they're not part of this remnant, they will become like Sodom and Gomorrah. And these are Paul's final words to this point, at least in this chapter here. And this is a heavy point to end on. He's saying here, if the Jews do not repent and call upon Jesus as their God, their King, embrace him as the Messiah, if they stay in this condition of hardening, then their fate is the same fate of wrath and judgment as one of the most vile episodes in Israel's history. And if that's not enough, Paul doesn't let go of the irony in verses 30 and 31. And he says words to the effect, you know, like the people, like the questions people asking, like, what, Paul, are you saying that law-abiding Jews are no better than the people of Sodom and Gomorrah? And that Gentiles who believe in Christ are actually more righteous than Jews who don't believe? And Paul's like, yeah, that, that's my exact point. Well, why? Well, in verse 32, this goes back to the point Paul's been making. They pursued righteousness that was man-made and devoid of faith. They thought that the law was a ladder to climb to attain the righteousness of God, when in reality, it was meant to be a mirror to show them how unrighteous they were and how much they needed the righteousness of God to cleanse them and forgive them and give them his righteousness. And so chapter 9 ends with Paul pointing everyone, his Jewish and Gentile readers, to Jesus, who is the Savior of his people, people of promise, and a stumbling block to those whom God has hardened. But if we trust him as our Lord, we will find the glorious riches we have in him. And so that's Romans chapter 9. Now, now having just finished this discussion about God's sovereignty over the salvation of people, I, I recognize that this teaching may be tough to hear, and it may be unsettling to us to hear about the nature of God. You see, we, we've been going through Romans chapter 9, and, and we've just taken a straightforward approach. This is what the Word of God says here, and it is clear about what it says. It doesn't give us any wiggle room about any other way to understand this passage than just simply to hear what it's saying and to submit to what it's saying. And so if you're struggling with these truths, I recognize that. I, I did too when I first was hearing all this stuff. But my encouragement would be to go back through this chapter and actually pray these truths back to God as praise. I mean, they're they're straightforward. And so just pray them back to God as praise. And so praise him and celebrate him for the promises he gave to Israel in verses 4 and 5. Praise him for the choices and the selections that he made with the sons of Abraham and Jacob and all the rest. Praise him for his sovereign wisdom over hardening Pharaoh's heart. Praise him for his sovereign choices of what he does with lumps of clay. Praise him that he calls people out from the Gentiles. Praise him that he calls people from among the Jews. And if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then praise him for choosing you and calling you 
and showing his mercy upon you that you heard his call and, and by his grace you repented of your sins and surrendered to Jesus as your Lord and King. And none of that would have been possible without God's mercy in your life and it's nothing that you can take credit for. And so praise him for all of these things. Again, now I recognize that even praying this will be difficult to say all these things. And so as you're praising God for these things, I would encourage you also to ask him to give you a heart that submits to what he is clearly saying in this chapter. In fact, there is another key truth we can also be praising God for in this chapter here, and that is that he has revealed these things to us. I mean, again, if we're considering these things for the first time, we just may not be sure we like any of this, but what would we rather have? Would, would we rather have these things be true, but he not tell us? I mean, that wouldn't be any good. In fact, if this truth was true and, and not revealed to us, our speculations will lead us down all kinds of wrong understandings about God. So praise him, he's revealed this to us. You might say, well, you know, I'd rather God just leave the choice up to us. But a God who is not sovereign over salvation creates a whole bunch of other problems. And most notably, the fact that since we're all spiritually dead, none of us would ever come to him because naturally speaking, we would all still want to follow in the path of Adam and, and do our own thing. So at least when God is sovereign, those whom he calls will hear his call and respond and they will come to him in faith. And so that's Romans 9. Again, I know it's not an easy chapter, but it's one that must leave us praising God for his sovereignty over our salvation. Thanks for listening and have a great day and God bless.